cybersecurity for the people, small business, NIST 800 53. Uh, doing an AWS implementation using the sticks for the computer implementation. We also gonna do a notional technology stack implementation that would be uh, approved by a government agency. Uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standard and Technology Information. This video is gonna go from a high level process, procedure, item, etc., to get NIST compliant. The management section will focus on risk management process, policies and procedure to access risk. The technology section will focus on a notional tech stack for NIST compliance, for federal compliance. Federal compliance basically is just the company reports to an oversight agency such as HIPAA, FISMA, FBI, NSA, IRS. So those oversight agencies will tell you what you need to have a this compliance system to report for that agency. Uh, if you look on the uh, slide stack, we're going to go over the uh, management portion once again. The IT will be the IT will be accepting risk, avoiding mitigation, sharing, and transferring information. External and internal uh, auditors will inspect the process for classifying and ranking our system. The risk management framework addresses the concern, security concerns for the organization re, re, related to the design, development, impl implementation, operation, and disposal information in the environment in which those systems operate. So this is actually the uh, flow chart for risk management framework. So step one is actually categorizing the system. Uh, step two is selecting your controls. Step three is implementing your controls. Step four is uh, accessing your controls. Step five is authorizing your information system. Step six is monitoring your security control. So step one is categorizing your controls. So if you look at the slide at the top right, they talk about laws, directives, policies, and guidance, goals, and operations. But usually the oversight uh, agency will categorize the system because you're doing business with them. So say you're doing business with a radar company for uh, for the uh, FAA for flight, that would be a high-level system. So the agency would say you have a, a high-level system, basically it's life or death. If that system goes down, someone can actually die. So that oversight agency will help you with step one, categorizing your system. Uh, then step two is once they categorize your system, uh, the uh, risk management controls will help you select the controls you need to actually do that work for that system. They have high, medium level controls and you, depending on what system you have, you will implement your highs, your medium or, or your system levels for that particular controls. Then once you select those controls uh, from the categorization of system, you are going to implement those controls. Basically, what are you going to put on your app server, web server, VLAN? Um, a database, what controls are you going to actually do to secure that system, lock down that system, and meet the compliance level for that oversight agency. Then once you put those on your system, you need to assess those controls to make sure they're working at an optimal level. They're actually doing what they said they're going to do. Then step five is when that oversight agency authorizes your system. So they're going to come in and access your system and says, okay, we accept the controls you put on there or we deny you access authorization to run that system. That's usually an ATO, authority to operate, right? So if they give you ATO, you have the authority to operate that authorized system for that agency. Then the uh, step six, of course, is actually monitoring that, that system, right? making sure those controls still work, making sure patches don't break those systems. And two is when you get back to step one, the following year, the agency might put different level of security, a high level of security, even different controls. Right. We're trying to keep up with hackers, uh, keep up with the lighting hacks. Right. So they're actually every year updating those controls, updating that uh, those virus protection and, and updating those controls to secure that level of system. This family of security controls, security and privacy controls described in this video have a well-defined organizational and structure. The family has 20 security controls. Each family contains security, privacy controls related to the specific topic for that family. 
Two character identifier uniquely identifies each control of family. The security and privacy controls may involve aspects of policy, oversight, supervision, manual process, and an automatic mechanism implemented by a system or actions by individuals. This is actually the 30,000 feet level. The table shows the specific family. AC is the access control. AT is awareness and training. AU is audit and accountability. CA is access authorization and monitoring. CM is configuration and management. CP is contingency planning. AI is identification and author authentication. IR is incident response. MA is maintenance. MP is media protection. PE is physical environment protection. PL is planning. PM is project management. PS is personal security. PT is uh, PII processing and transparency. RA is risk assessment. SA is system and service acquisition. SC is system communication and protection. SI is system information and integrity. SR is supply chain risk management. The NIST 20 security families makes up the majority of a cybersecurity program. We will delve deeper into each of these security families in future videos. Each security family has sub-controls for that family. The sub-control baseline is broken down into low, moderate, and high. The oversight agencies assign low, moderate, or high for their data classification. Uh, the sequence priority codes for security control implement, implementation show what order you should implement these sub-families uh, of control. This is the 20,000 foot level. Let's walk through AU, the other sub-families of controls. As you can see on the slide, at the top, once again, is low, moderate, and high. So depending on your system, these are the sub-families of this control you will implement. That is, this is the audit and accountability. AU1 is audit, accountability, policies, and procedures. AU2 is audit and events. AU3 is contacts, contents of audits and records. AU4 is audit storage capacity. AU5 is response to audit processing failures. AU6 is audit review, analysis, and reporting. AU7 is audit reduction report generation. AU8 is timestamps. AU9, protection of audit information. AU10 is non-repudiation. AU11 is audit record retention. AU12 is audit generation. AU13 is monitoring for information disclosure. AU14 is session audit. AU15 is alternate audit capabilities. AU16 is cross-organizational auditing. The audit sub-control enhancement table. More detail is presented in each subfamily. Security control baselines are known in priority by P0, P1, P2, P3. These are for the orders of tasks. Security, security control baselines are indicated by X in the column for the selected baselines for withdrawn by controls. Each year, some controls are taken away or moved to other sub-control families. The insurance is the measure of confidence that the security function features, practice, policies, and procedures, mechanisms, and architecture of organizational information systems accurately mitigate and enforce and establish security policies. This is the 10,000 foot level. Let's dig into some of these controls. If you look, each uh, subfamily is further enhanced by more detail. Uh, let's look at AU3, the content of of audit records. AU31, the content of audit records adds additional information. AU32, contents of audit records and the centralized management of an audit plan and record content. If you look over, once again, we have the low, modern, and high systems. So if you look at AU3-2, uh, centralized management of a plan audit content is basically a SIM. A SIM is usually very expensive. That's why it's only uh, indicated needed for a high value system because it needs that uh, security of tracking those events and having all that um, information centralized. But for a high system, you need to uh, pay, pay for that additional cost. 
The security control structure consists of the following components. A control section, a supplemental guidance section, a control and enhancement section, a reference section, and a priority baseline and allocation section. The following example for auditing and accountability a family illustrates the structure of the uh, following security control. Once again, the audit three content of audit records, um, the control added supplemental guidance. This gives you super detailed instruction of what that control is actually doing. Let's look at the guidance for, uh, once again, the audit records. The supplemental guidance states audit record contents that may be necessary to satisfy the requirement of the control includes, for example, timestamp, sources, destination address, user and process, identif identifiers, event and description, success and failure indication, file names involved, access control, or the flow of the following rules and invoked. Event outcomes can include indicators of the event success or failure and event specific results. See, this gives you detail uh, guidance of what that actually um, audit record should look like. So when your auditors come in, you can pinpoint exactly what you need to do to satisfy that finding for your auditors. Security Technical Implementation Guide or STIG is a methodology for standardized, secure installation and maintenance of computer software hardware. This term was coined by DISA, which creates configuration documentation in support of the United States Department of Defense. This implementation guide includes recommended administration processes and span devices and life cycle. STIG applies to the whole company, desktop, Unix, web server database, and app servers, etc. If you look to the left, that's an Apache Server 2.4 Unix server check. Once again, it's uh, an audit check. So if you look at if you look at the specific check, it tells you what you need to do to uh, pass an audit for your audit findings. Also, if you look at the bottom at the CCI, that specific check on a web server tells you which uh, NIST check it rolls up to. If you look, that check applies to AU-3.1. We just looked at the uh, enhancement controls to specifically tell us what do we need to do to satisfy for that uh, NIST document of families? Once again, this is the exact check. This is where the rubber meets the road. The STIG check could be actually a couple thousand checks depending on how big your organization is. Uh, you have a lot of app servers, web servers, and database, uh, VLANs, uh, load balance, etc. So if you look to the left, it says initial security control baseline. That would be the perfect world if we could put all those stigs on every component and it works flawlessly. That never happens. So if you look at the tailoring guidance, identifying and designating common controls, applying the scoping considerations, selecting compensated controls. Once you do everything on that tailoring guidance, you will have a tailored security baseline specifically for your organization. Then once you get that, if you look at the bottom box, you need to document those security decisions for your auditors and your oversight agency. Why did you not put some of those controls on? Why did you enhance some, some of those controls? So let's dig down just a little more in this last size, size on this last slide. It talks about customizing security for your organization. If you actually looked at the STIG check, it actually has security checks that have CAT 1, 2s, and 3s. Cat ones are the most severe. Cat ones will leave your system easy to hack. So cat ones must be fixed in a timely manner. Cat ones have usually the fewest checks. Some checks will actually break your application. Some checks are too expensive. Some checks won't work for your org just because the way you do business. That's why we need to customize those checks and create an overlay that's specifically for that component in your business. This will maximize security, cost, risk, and satisfy your NIST requirement. Uh, thank you very much. This is the ending for the management portion of this. Please subscribe to my channel. Once again, thank you very much. Cybersecurity for the people, small business. This is the Notional Technology Stack for Amazon Web Service, Tomcat, Java, and MySQL.
Amazon Web Service is a subsidiary of Amazon providing an on-demand cloud computing platform and APIs to individuals, companies, and government on a metered pay-as-you-go basis. This cloud computing web service provides a variety of basic abstract technical infrastructures and dist distributed computing uh, building blocks and tools. AWS versions of virtual uh, computers emulates most of the attributes of a real computer, including hardware, central processing unit, graphical processing units for processing, local RAM, memory, hard disk, SSD storage, a choice of operating systems, networking and preloaded applications, software such as web servers, app servers, databases, and customer relationship management CRM products. Security and compliance is a shared responsibility between the AWS and the customer. The shared model can help relieve the customer operational burden as AWS operates, manages, and controls the components from the host operating system and virtualization layer down to the physical security of the facilities in which those service operates. The customer assumes responsibility and management of the guest operating systems, including updates and security patches, other associated application software, as well as configuration of AWS provides provided security group firewalls. Customers should carefully consider the services they choose as their responsibilities vary depending on that service used. The integration of those services into the environment and application laws and regulations. The nature of the shared responsibility also provides flexibilities and customer controls that permits the deployment. As shown in the chart below, it differentiates the responsibility commonly referred to as the security of the cloud versus security in the cloud. <clears throat> Just because your app is in AWS does not make it secure. The organization owns its security. If your organization is hacked, the fines are the organizational responsibility. This is Amazon's standard diagram for a web hosting application. Uh, this is what most companies will set up as their initial architecture. The public layer, aka the web server layer, the customer interface or connects to the web server. This is the outward facing presentation to the world, company logo and the image to the internet. The web server can spin up additional computing power when needed for more connections. The second place is the application layer. This is where the logic of the code is placed, Java or C Sharp or anything you use to calculate uh, things for your company. Web servers from a customer standpoint can only talk to the application layer. The database layer is the last layer is the database layer. The storage layer where the data, product, and intellectual property are stored. This is what hackers are trying to steal. This is usually the ultimate goal to get to the company's information. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, Amazon VPC, enables you to launch an Amazon Web Service resource into a virtual network that you have defined. The network closely resembles a traditional network that you operate in your own data center. With the benefits of using the scalable infrastructure of AWS, a virtual private cloud is virtual network dedicated to your AWS account. It is logically isolated from other virtual networks in the AWS cloud. You can launch your AWS resource such as Amazon EC2 into your VPC. You can configure your VPC. You can select this IP range, create subnets, configure route table, network gateways, and security settings. If you look at the proposed diagram, you have a management VPC where all your traffic flows through first. With this uh, VPC, you can do all your logging, your NAT, and your uh, bash and host. If you look up at the top, that actually is your production VPC. Once again, each one of those three boxes is your th uh, three-tier arch architecture that we talked about above, your web server, app server, and database. Now with VPC, we can control the traffic, what can see what and who can see what. And also when you're working from home, you can actually put your IP address of your workstation and then on, only your workstation can get to certain AWS resources. Uh, also what's normally, normally configured in is your development VPC. So you can do all your test work on the below box, 
get it all figured out, then promote it to your production VPC at the top. Right, so this is traditional development for a small company or a large company. Here's a few items that you will build inside your VPC to make sure it is secure. You will create a private network within your VPC. You will create security groups for each instance. You will create a jump box or bastion host to work inside your VPC. Of course, you will have two-factor authentication on your jump box. You will restrict SSA access to your jump boxes within your security group. You also will use outbound security groups. Uh, you would also have a central log server, preferably uh, Splunk. You could actually encrypt your uh, individual disk volume. VPC Amazon logical networking is very important. <clears throat> it tells what tiers can talk to what tiers. It can tell what apps can talk to what apps. It can tell what workstation can control what workstation. And for, in further videos, we will nail down specifically how to configure that for a NIST uh, configuration. The next slide, let's uh, put it all together. If you look at the slide on the left, it is the stick checklist. If you look at the bottom, it has the NIST family of controls. If you see the AU3, that was the auditing uh, NIST check. If you look at the fixed check above that, <coughs> That actually is the stick setting you would set on an application server to get the format you need. Now, if you look to the right, that actually is the artifact or sample log that will come out for that auditing check. If you see to the left, 7928, 4325 is the IP address of the <coughs> component that touched that particular web server. You can see it was a Git uh, <coughs> format. That is the internet address. It was HTTP 1.1. That shows you the protocol and the format version. <clears throat> the 200 is the success code for a web application. 14487 is the payload length. <clears throat> How big was the payload you brought back from that Git? It shows you the Google website it came back. It also shows you it was a Mozilla web br browser with an IE60 compatibility for Windows NT5. <clears throat> So that's actually what's in the log file that satisfies that actual NIST component. <clears throat> Next, we're going to show once you lo load all those logs from the application server, web server, and database, what you could do with a professional SIM that could help your security. Splunk enables rapid security investigation and analysis. We will be walking you through a quick Splunk security investigation experience to show you how Splunk can immediately help you identify indication of compromise and quickly determine the scope and the cause of threats. In this exercise, we'll look for patterns of authentication failure across our entire infrastructure to detect potential bad actors. The result you see on the screen can be found using the SPL search command above. We will be looking for any event with failed password in them. As we search fail, Splunk's search ahead feature will return variations of the search that match fail. This can help us to refine what to look for. By using a wildcard or star, we'll get results for any event that begin with fail, including fails, failed, and failures. For password, notice the search ahead feature shows there are events where password is equal to specific values. We can select one of these pre-populated searches to find the events that match specific criteria or just events that match password. So far we can see a simple fail star password search found all failed system access attempts across our entire infrastructure according to our event logs. And with search ahead, Splunk can help guide you through the investigation process. Our result shows there are approximately 2,500 events that match fail star password. The timeline panel shows the distribution of matching events over time. Using the histogram, you can zoom in and out of timeframes to understand distribution of events over time. Here you can select the time range. These are the fields associated with the resulting events and the raw events with the matching terms highlighted. To determine what systems are affected, we look at the type of events. This is represented in Splunk as a source type. Source type indicates what type of data it is. So in this example, we see four source types that contain the search pattern fail password, which represent Windows, Linux, database, and a file server. You can track down authentication failures in Splunk with a single search versus querying from four different tools or data sources. Splunk allows you to find a pattern across an entire technology stack, 
regardless of the type or source of data. Now that we've narrowed our initial search, we can look at fields extracted from the raw data to continue our investigation. First, we'll select the fields necessary to analyze the failed authentication attempts. We want to select destination, that shows where they are trying to go, source, that shows where they originated from, and the users that are associated with failed logins. We'll select these from the fields panel in the left and move them into the selected fields panel. Starting with the dest field, this indicates servers or hosts that are being accessed. We can see this represents 60 different hosts, and this shows all the top target hosts that someone is attempting to access. E-commerce-03 has more than 1,400 login failures, and AD-19 server has several hundred access failures, and we see authentication failures on several other hosts. This shows us where the majority of our attacks are targeted. The source fields indicate what workstations are originating the most login failures and where they are located. This 10.11.36.20 host seems to have some unusual amount of activities, and this POS terminal is also contributing to the high number of authentication failures. The user fields indicate which target users have the highest number of login failures. Browsing the fields in the exploration panel provides fast context into where the account failure attempts are originating and the targeted accounts or assets. Now we've got the information we need to continue our investigation to make linkages between which hosts are attempting to log in to which target hosts using which accounts. So we'll use a pipe operator and then the stats command to help us aggregate the number of failures by origin of access, target system, users on the target system, and the type of system. We see the stats command calculated the total number of authentication failures associating the failure counts to the origin IP, target host, and user credentials used to access the system. Next, we can use the sort command to show descending order and highlight the highest number of login failures by session, session being a combination of the unique source, destination, and user. Finally, we apply the where command to show only authentication failure activities by source client to a host with more than two failure attempts. The ability to apply conditions on calculated results, in this case, sum of total failed login attempts, makes Splunk a powerful security analytics platform. And we can do some more advanced search examples to demonstrate the possibilities. For now, though, using Splunk, we've discovered potential threat activities by finding authentication failures from across our entire network. And then we've applied calculations and logic so we know where to focus our investigation. We've got two issues here. First, someone has tried to access the e-commerce 03 host more than 1,400 times. That's most likely a scripted attack. But there's also this host with the IP 10.1.21.153 that seems to be probing the network by accessing multiple web servers in the cloud, and more critically, attempting to gain access to this database-001 server. Through this demonstration, we have shown how Splunk can quickly search and detect potential threats using simple Splunk search commands, or SPL. In the next video segment, we'll drill in to further validate the threat activities we found. Stay tuned.